Welcome to Our Girl Relationships. We talk about the problems people face in their day-to-day -day lives. Let's start with the video. I have always known that I wasn't my husband, Tim's first love, and I was okay with that because he wasn't my first love either. What I didn't know was that the difference between the two of us was the fact that I was indeed over my first love and had fallen in love with him while Tim was still in love with his ex-fiancé. And his first love, Aria, who had very conveniently left him for the rich jock from undergraduate school. Tim was heartbroken and that is when we met as friends. Both of us being fresh out of relationships, we were there for each other, but it was only after a couple of years of getting to know each other did we start dating. This wasn't enough for Tim's family though because it seemed like they were sort of going through their own process of getting over area the moment Tim introduced them to me. Literally four years after they had broken up, I was made the barn of all sorts of jokes and compromises to how area was better than me. Being the patient, compassionate, naive young girl that I was, I always endured it all with nothing but a smile on my face because, of course, I wanted to impress them and the fact that Tim would side with me sometimes was more than enough for me. This was my demeanor for the most part of our relationship, even when people told me how much I was letting Tim and his family walk all over me. I would simply just ignore them or would go as far as to argue with them because something inside me thought that my in-laws were simply just overprotective over Tim because he hadn't been with anyone except Aria. That was the only explanation that ever made sense to me and is what I went along with. Thus, with that assumption, I would go above and beyond to show everyone how much I cared for Tim, how much I adored my in-laws, and how much I wanted to be a part of them. It was of no avail, though, and eventually, like any sane human would, I'm assuming, I started to lose my temper slowly and steadily. I started questioning Tim on the behavior of my in-laws, and of course, Tim didn't like it, and that embarked on an argument-filled married life between the two of us. Recently, I reached a point where I was spiraling down deep into depression because of everything that had been going on between Tim and I. So much so that once in the heat of the moment, I got divorce papers. I knew I wasn't going to do it. I was too scared and nervous and just didn't have it in me. So I had set it aside in my bag. Eventually, I found out something that gave me confirmation that I just wouldn't be able to get divorced from Tim. It was my positive pregnancy test. Everything just became blurred for me there onwards because I knew there wasn't any escape from this relationship now and I just had to make the most I could out of this situation. The fact that Tim seemed so happy when I revealed to him my pregnancy and suggested that we surprise his family when we went out for our yearly vacation gave me a ray of hope that things just might get better. But of course, they didn't. I prepared a small gift box with t-shirts for everyone that said, future dad, future grandpa, yada, yada. And the box also consisted of my positive pregnancy test. I was so excited about it all because even Tim didn't know that this was the surprise I had made. I had prepared everything and it was the first night of the vacation itself that I was going to reveal the news to everyone until Tim decided that it wasn't going to happen. It was the evening on the first day of the trip itself when he pulled me aside and asked me if I could leave. I was dumbfounded, sort of, because this was very sudden. I asked him if I had done anything wrong, to which he very casually said no and confessed to me the real reason why. Apparently, Aria was going to be there and she was getting divorced from her husband. Tim was quite literally blushing as he confessed all of this to me and told me that he was looking into trying to rekindle things with her. I couldn't believe the sheer audacity of this man. 
I knew I had to leave if I had even an inch of self-respect left inside of me, but before doing so, I left him and his family a little gift in our bedroom, and it was so worth it. I found out all about it the same night itself when my mother-in-law called me up screaming at me for apparently scaring away area. I mean, what was so scary about finding a pregnancy test? Future dad, t-shirt and divorce papers in a bedroom. Didn't that make their plans of cheating even sexier? I asked the same to my mother-in-law while laughing. She got very flustered because she knew her son had messed up. Needless to say, my phone has been blowing up like crazy ever since that incident with everyone calling me all sorts of names and threatening me with all sorts of things because apparently the child that I'm pregnant with cannot belong to Tim. I'm astounded at the audacity of these people but can't help but question if I was wrong under any circumstances. So, hey, ITA. I have decided that I really need to get out of this place. The comments you guys left were truly eye-opening, as if this was the slap in the face I was looking for. I had truly lost a lot of my self-respect over love because I thought love was all about sacrifices and adjustments. Unfortunately, though, I didn't realize that I was the only one making these sacrifices and adjustments while Tim was using me as a replacement for area all this while. I have moved into my cousin's place recently and have been avoiding all and every contact with Tim and his family who have been still blowing up my phone. I think I first need to clear out my head as to what my next move should be. I also need to start attending regular doctor's appointments to keep track of my baby's health. A lot is going on, but I can only hope with time everything will fall into place. As much as I didn't want to, I met up with Tim because, after all, we had to discuss things. Of course, though, ever since the situation occurred, Tim hasn't changed a single bit and still blames me for everything that happened. I told him that I wasn't interested in all that and wanted to talk about the divorce. That is when he showed me his surprised Pikachu face while having the audacity to ask me if I was being for real about the divorce. This stupid man really thought I was going to take him back after everything he had done and let him have his fantasy with his first love. I put it straight to him, and that is when he blew up at me, telling me that he wanted a DNA test before he would even climb the stairs of the court. I happily obliged, and needless to say, the test results have come positive. I have realized that this man and his family will never come to a firm agreement that will allow us all to save money, time, and energy. And honestly, at this point, I'm just taking it all as a curse that came with the fact that I decided to marry this man. I will be spending as much money as I possibly can on a good divorce lawyer and fight this case to the best of my abilities because I can't get myself to care for a man that clearly does not care for me or even his own blood. I will keep you guys updated about it all eventually. I had posted on this subreddit exactly a year ago asking you guys for advice about a situation that I was going through with my now ex-husband and ex-in-laws. I logged out of the account because I had a lot on my plate to deal with, starting from my pregnancy, the divorce, moving houses, finding a job, and a lot of emotional stress. When I started this post, up to my last update, I would have never been able to say that I could ever see myself reaching a point where I was a single mom of one and so independent. All thanks to my very traditional parents, who always taught me that I was nothing without a man. Well, now that the divorce is finalized and I'm as far away as I possibly can be from a man like Tim, I can proudly say I can do it. Things weren't all that easy, though, coming from a small town that I was in, I got berated a lot. I was constantly shamed and questioned about my character for simply taking a stand for myself. 
Thankfully, with the support of amazing people like my friends, cousins, and my boss, I was able to stand on my own feet and shut down all the forces that tried to drag me down. Now, owning a small house of my own with the divorce settlement I received and having a job that allows me to give my son the life he deserves, I can happily say that I feel like I'm on the top of the mountain watching Tim and my in-laws once again grieving the loss of Aria, who never returned that night after, and also the loss of me. I hope this is an eye-opening lesson for a man like Tim who really needs to stop being influenced by his parents, which, unfortunately, I highly doubt he ever will be. Lastly, I hope this post has inspired at least some of you going through a similar situation like mine, the importance of having self-respect and dignity for yourself. Because trust me, You all are so much more than that relationship tying you down and holding you back from the amazing person you are. Thank you. NTA, Tim is literally being babied by his family. This post makes him look like he has the mental capabilities of a toddler who would do anything for his family's validation. I'm glad OP left and didn't let her son grow up becoming like his dad. NTA, Tim and his family sound deranged, and OP can honestly be so much better than that. My brother, Tom, is divorced and has two kids, Kim, who is 19, Liz, who is 17. Because mine and Tom's father was a deadbeat, he didn't want to raise us and ran off to avoid his child support obligations. Tom is barely around for his own kids, yet expects to be praised and hailed as the world's greatest father for providing the bare minimum. Tom expects his ex-wife, Rose, to schedule all the kids' events, appointments, and constantly remind him of all of the kids' events like he's a child himself. Rose will notify Tom weeks in advance of an appointment or event through email and their court-monitored messaging site. She'll send a follow-up reminder both the week and the day before the event, including school events, where Tom's already sent an email by the school. Tom forgets and then blames Rose for being irresponsible, since it would take 10 seconds for Rose to send me a text, she knows I don't check my email or court monitored site every day. Tom has reminders set on his phone for Facebook, but he can't be bothered to set up a calendar app. Kim told me that she can count on her hands how many of her events, appointments, Tom has ever shown up to. The breaking point for Kim was when Tom forgot about her high school graduation and was instead out drinking with his friends. Kim is at college and has not spoken to Tom once since her 18th birthday. Instead of this being a wake-up call for Tom, he again blames Rose and expects to be hailed as the world's greatest father because he financially provides the bare minimum and still is never there for Liz. Tom gets Liz for one and a half weeks a month, and Liz says Tom is never even there And she's just stuck house dog sitting. Liz said that Tom couldn't remember a single one of her friends or teachers when she pressed him about it. While we were visiting our mother's house, Tom was complaining because he had not shown up to Liz's driving test where she got her license and blamed Rose again. Tom then complained about Liz because now talking to her is like pulling teeth and how she tries to make me feel unloved in my own home. Her mother's turned her into an inconsiderate brat. I was biting my tongue before, but Tom insulting his own daughter that way made me see red. I snapped that, Tom, you're a pathetic excuse for a father. How can you expect people to praise you when you give as few shits about Kim and Liz as our father did about us? Tom screamed his head off, but I left. Several people are calling me an a-hole because, unlike me, Tom was old enough to remember when our father left and I was out of line to essentially throw that trauma in his face. Also, 
that Tom just didn't have someone to model how a father should act to him, but instead of trying to gently correct him, which I've tried many times in the past, I insulted and used profanity towards Tom. I think everything I said was true and deserved. And no matter what, shitty childhoods don't excuse shitty adult behavior. A-I-T-A? Ignore those several people. Every time Tom brags about how great he is, call him on it. Every single time. Once he learns that he can't pull this shit in your presence, he'll probably stop. You're acting as though his statements make your blood boil. Your blood should be boiling. You're on speaking terms with Kim. I hope with Liz too. Cultivate that. Every once in a while, find a way to praise Rosie for her job as a mom. Maybe even you, together with your spouse, if you're married or have a significant other, can um send her flowers on Mother's Day if you're in the U.S. Oh, and NTA. NTA. While you maybe could have dealt with this better and more tactfully, your brother is an a-hole and sooner or later someone would have said as such to him. Probably one of his kids. So maybe it was better that you got the lash back instead of them. Many folks grow up with deadbeat parents and they become stellar parents because they very much do not want to be like their own were. They do not want their children to experience things that they did. Just because your dad sucked does not give a free pass to be like it too. NTA, your brother is delusional if he thinks giving money is all that it takes to be a good parent and earn their child's love and respect. And trauma from being left is not a defense when he is doing virtually the same thing his father did, abandoning his responsibility. On the contrary, that experience should have taught him what not to do when he gets a family. Nothing wrong with calling a deadbeat a deadbeat. Who knows? That might be what he needs to wake up from his delusions. I guess making fun is the wrong term, more like bringing them up in an argument. For context, we're both in high school. When my best friend was in middle school, his girlfriend at the time passed away. Understandably, he was scarred. He never healed from it. And of course, whenever he needed to talk about it or was just sad about it, I would be there for him as a shoulder to cry on or as someone to talk to. I also have a dog. I have had this dog since I was three years old. So she has been a part of my family for as long as I can remember. She is, of course, very old, but she also has cancer and is blind and deaf. Essentially, a walking corpse at this point. My mom came in to tell me to say my goodbyes to her because she likely wasn't going to make it through the week. Of course, being sad, I thought it to be a good idea to reach out to my friend as he had done so many times to me. Instead of being there for me, he decided that it was a good idea to have a debate about whether or not I should put my dog down and how she should have died a long time ago. Obviously, I wasn't in the mood for this, and as politely as I could, told him I didn't want to debate him on this and that I was just sad and wanted someone to be there for me, to which he continued to dig into it. At this point, I was pissed. As he began to start making jokes about me being an animal abuser, to which I blurted out that he was a prick and that I was hurting at the moment and his jokes were making it worse, he continued. I then said, I will remember this the next time you reach out to me about your dead ex-girlfriend, you prick. Obviously, not the right thing to say. He was, at this point, furious at me, stating that I was never his friend, that none of my friends liked me, and how he hopes my dog dies violently and painfully and such. I eventually apologized for bringing his dead ex into the conversation, but he has yet to apologize for anything he has said to me and likely won't. I understand where he's coming from, but I was so shocked that I had been there for him so many times about serious issues, but the moment I want someone to be there for me, he tried his best to make things worse. AMTA? NTA, you didn't say anything offensive about his girlfriend that might hurt him. You just stated that if you can't vent to him, he can't vent to you either. 
don't know why people are saying you're the a-hole. NTA, and you shouldn't have apologized because what you said was less wrong than what he said. Also, he let his true colors out after. If you've been friends for as long and helped him with his dead ex, he should be there for you, but instead he makes jokes and everything. Sorry to say, but that is not a friend. You still sound young, so you will find other real friends. Let me tell you that sometimes having no friends, which you choose, is better than having toxic friends like that. I've known people before that treated pets like they are exchangeable. I've lost my cat after 17 years and it hurts. You don't deserve a trash friend like that. Take care of yourself because that friend obviously won't. Dude. NTA, whether you should have or shouldn't have put your dog down isn't his business. How he treated you is horrible. He should not be cracking jokes like that. I've only once ever cracked a joke when my friend told me her animal died. For one, it was before we met that it died. For two, the way it died was a weird way. And for three, I apologize and I still feel guilty even though I was 12. I don't know how old your friend is, but unless he's a kid, then there's no excuse. And how he went on and on about it is horrible. I'm sorry he did that to you. You did not deserve that at all.